was Vanna White in the past life. <laughs> All right, we're going to talk about the classes that are going on here at the chapel. And the first one is the Believe class, which is offered twice, uh, once in the morning here on Sunday morning just prior to service, and then on Wednesday evening. By the way, they're, they're titled differently. One is, at the evening, is Who Am I Becoming in the conference room, and then the one in the morning just says Believe class. I think that is what happened to me or something like that. Um, and then we're canceling the Man's Search for God today after church because of the cruise. How many are going on the cruise that we're planning to come to? I guess I could, we could do the class on the boat. What do you think? Oh, there you go. Okay. So the, if you don't mind, then come Monday night. <clears throat> and then um, what else we have? Oh, the lunch and learn. Awesome. We're doing uh, a segment next week on language and where Jesus was coming from and what happens when language is translated from his native tongue, Aramaic, to Greek, to English. I think you'll find that very interesting. So please, it's, uh, it's one you can attend. Any, it's not a series necessarily. It's a freestanding, so please join us. You didn't see that. Did <clears throat> if you're going on the Starlight Majesty cruise, I don't really know what's happening because I've never done that before. But I understand if you're parked in the parking lot across the street, free parking ends at 12.30. So you're going to want to go move your car over here. So hang out, have some orange juice, then move your car. Then we're going to be using Florida free rides to get to the, uh, to the cruise ship, I understand. Um, did you talk about walking? You walk down from the steps. So we have brand new walking clubs that we would love to invite you to on Wednesday at 9 a.m. and then again at 6 p.m. for our sun, uh, sunset walk. So this is for exercise, it's for fun. Uh, somebody called it walk, walking church. So we hope you'll enjoy coming out and joining us for a walk on Wednesday. I believe we have four extra tickets for the Starlight Cruise, is that right? Can somebody confirm that? Anyone, anyone? Check out here after the service and see. I, I know we have at least one and maybe a, a couple of others. All right, that's it. Lent is a season where we come together and fix our eyes on the cross. We deepen our thought life about Christ and what Christ has done for us. We recognize that Christ did something completely unexpected in coming to earth and dying and in his resurrection. So let's fix our eyes on Christ as we gather to worship in spirit and in truth. to another glorious sunrise and all the promise each new day brings, will you please join me in the call to worship responsibly. 30 pieces of silver. Jesus was sold for a bag of coins. Yet we have sold our commitment for far less. Doubts, distractions, disillusionment have kept us from offering ourselves wholly. But not today. Today we focus our minds and Source of manifold blessings.
On God, let us recite the invocation in unison. O oh God, we bow in gratitude before you. We constantly distort your image, but still you restore it. We daily betray your love, but still you extend it. Come unto us at this time, and in this place, Lord. Your image in us are you revealed, and your love for us returned. Amen. the crowd. 
ground you took the fall and thought of me above like a rose trampled on the ground you took the fall and thought of me Above gratitude for the many gifts we have received and in commitment to our church, please let us be generous in this morning's offerings as the ushers come forth.
As we go to the Lord in prayer today, our nation gives thanks for the life of Billy Graham, who had a great impact uh, on the church in America and beyond, and perhaps even on your life. So let's give thanks for, for Billy. Today we also give thanks for the life of Dick Burke, who went to be with the Lord on Monday. And so we pray for the Burke family. We pray for you, Jan. Services for Dick will be on March the 17th here at the chapel. And yesterday we gave thanks for the life of Gordon Bell. Uh, these beautiful flowers are from the Bell family in memory of Gordon. So let's hold these and others before God as we go to the Lord in prayer. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and renew right spirits within us. For we have wandered, we have strayed. Each of us has turned our own way. But in this moment, right now, we find ourselves in you, surrounded by your peace, held in your acceptance, lavished by your grace, and enlivened by your love. And we are thankful. Help us extend those blessings to those who are most in need of your mercy, to those who seem far away from your path, whether by circumstance or bad choices or systemic oppression. Help us extend the warmth of your welcome to those who are lonely or grieving, to those who are lost in the wilderness of life, those struggling or unsure, disillusioned, those who fail to recognize their lostness, because maybe they've found success in the world's eyes or because they are able to appear as if they have it all together. But, oh Lord, we know that none of us have it all together. So find us in our lostness as we seek your face in the silence. And let us pray the prayer our Lord Jesus Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our scripture lesson today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. You can find it on your pew Bible on page 850. I'll be reading a few more verses than I uh, first thought when I put the bulletin together. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, "Uh, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness And go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. And just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I lost. And just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine took the place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hands have bread enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will get up, and I will go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father, but while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. And then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But his father said to his slaves, Quickly bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his fingers and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. And now his elder son was in the field and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, Your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. And his father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I've been working like a slave for you. I've never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because... This brother of yours, he was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Thanks be to God for the reading of God's word.
Have you ever been in a conversation and somebody insulted you? Or am I the only one? <laughs> and it caught you so off guard that you just stood there like this. <laughs> and you had nothing to say in response until when? You get in the car and you drive home and you're like, oh, I wish I would have said that. That would have gotten them. Well, I never want to be caught in that situation again, so I've done some studying on masterful comebacks. <laughs> I've got my top five. I'm going to share them with you. Pastor Rhonda's top five comebacks. Number five. You know, someday you're going to go far, and I hope you stay there. <laughs> All right. All right, number four. Oh, it's so cute when you try to talk about things you just don't understand. <laughs> Number three. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I love what you've done with your hair, but how do you get it to come out of your nostrils like that? <laughs> Sorry, I tickled myself. <laughs> you like that? Number, Number four. Oh, hey, um, you've got something on your chin. No, 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 the third one down. <laughs> okay, all right, we could go on. This is my last one. This is my favorite as a pastor. You know, Jesus loves you, but everyone else thinks you're a jerk. <laughs> all right. A little levity to get started. If ever there was a comeback master, it was Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus was like a comeback Jedi master, like the ones that I shared with you were biting, but there was no subtlety to them. Jesus, on the other hand, was always equipped with a comeback that, that made people just buy in and, and listen deeply, and then, bada bam, bait and switch, he gets you at the end. And I think that's what's happening here in Luke chapter 15. I ended up reading the whole thing for you because it just kind of all goes together. And so the Pharisees, like they are wont to do, they come to Jesus and they're complaining and they're grumbling. and He's eating with sinners and tax collectors. So Jesus, the Jedi master at comebacks, says, let me tell you a couple of stories. And so he tells stories which we think are about inclusion and lostness and, and the desire of God to bring all people into the fold. And he starts with the, the story of the shepherd and the lost sheep. And the sheep is found and there's great celebration. And then he moves to the woman who's lost a coin and the coin is found and there's great celebration. And then the next story is about, we call it the story of the prodigal son, but I like to think of it as the story of the loving father. The loving father has lost a son. And when that son comes back, there is great celebration. My son is lost, and now he has been found. But there's a little bait and switch in this story. I'm going to read to you what Eugene Peterson writes about it. He says, in order to unmask our self-righteousness, Jesus tells four, not three, stories of lostness, to comprise a single parable. The first thing we see in this story is the father's passive search for his younger son, always watching. He waits for the son to take the first step and then goes out to find the son, runs to him. Peterson says this is in contrast with the older son where the father takes the first step and goes out to find him. Discernment is required when deciding whether to wait or to act. The first three stories are built on the same structure, Peterson writes, lost, search, found, celebration. But the fourth story, the older brother, is incomplete. The self-righteous listeners, which include not just the Pharisees but us, he writes, have been sucked in and are now hit with the bait and switch. The parable isn't about those losers. It's about us. 
The self-righteous are the most lost ones of the bunch, and having lost our sense of lostness, we may never be found. Yes, we are to look for the lost, but we must retain a sense of our own lostness. Until we claim our lostness, it's really difficult to be found. And I think a great example of this is from Scripture is is Judas Iscariot, who followed Jesus for three years, gave his life to following Jesus. But somewhere along the way, this is how I, I think this happened, somewhere along the way he grew disillusioned. You see, Jesus wasn't living up to Judas's expectations of what Messiah should be. And so the disillusionment grew, and Judas's self-righteousness grew as, as, as he had all of these expectations, and Jesus had another idea. And so Judas sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. He may have found 30 pieces of silver, but he lost his soul in the meantime. The power in these stories is not to see ourselves as the one looking for the lost souls. The power in this story is recognizing that we are the lost ones. We are the lost sheep. We are the lost coin. We are the lost younger brother. And yes, we are the lost older brother. There's no better way to uh, illustrate this, this idea of our running from God, our hiding from God, and God's relentless pursuit of us than this little children's story that we read at my house a lot. It's called The Runaway Bunny. You may have read this story. Once there was a little bunny who wanted to run away, so he said this to his mother, I'm running away. Well, if you run away, said his mother, I will run after you, for you are my little bunny. If you run after me, said the little bunny, I will become a fish in a trout stream, and I will swim away from you. If you become a fish in a trout stream, said his mother, I will become a fisherman and I will fish for you. If you become a fisherman, said the little bunny, I will become a rock on the mountain high above you. Well, if you become a rock on a mountain high above me, said his mother, I will be a mountain climber and I will climb to where you are. And so the little bunny decides he's going to be a crocus in a hidden garden. And he decides he's, he's going to be a bird and fly away. And he's going to be a sailboat and sail away. And he's going to be, he's going to go off to the circus and fly away on a flying trapeze. And the mother bunny says, if you fly away on a flying trapeze, I will be a tightrope walker and I will walk across the air to you. And finally, at the end of the book, the little bunny gives up and he says, shucks, I might as well just stay where I am and be your little bunny. <laughs> and so he did. Have a carrot, said the mother bunny. God relentlessly pursues us like a mother longing for her child god is constantly there waiting on us one poet said god is the hound of heaven who just keeps searching and searching for us no matter how far we run or how fast we go or wherever we hide god is there waiting my first ministry job was as a youth director, as a lot of ministers have to go through that. Um, <laughs> and my kids love to play this game called sardines. Do you know the game sardines? It's like hide and go seek, except it's a group. One person hides, you turn off the lights. Everyone else tries to find that one person, and when you find it, you hide with them until you're packed in there like what? A box of sardines. Okay. I'm pretty good at sardines. And this one time at the church, we were playing, and the lights were off, and, and church is a great place to play sardines, by the way. We'll have to do that one day. We'll play sardines. 
And I had discovered this roll of carp, this really tall roll of carpeting standing up in the corner behind the chancel. And so it was my turn to hide, and I got that carp, and I kind of unrolled it, and I shimmied myself into, into the roll of carpet, and, and all of a sudden, the carpet and I fell over. <laughs> and then I heard footsteps, so I was stuck. And it was hard to breathe in there, so shallow breaths, shallow breaths. And it got really hot. I was hotter than Marco Rubio at a gun uh, control form. <laughs> <laughs> And I was contorted, and it was so uncomfortable. And, and I was there for, I think it was about an hour. I, I was the master. I was there for about an hour. I could hear the conversations of the kids. They were getting frustrated, and I kind of at first giggled, and then I really desperately wanted to be found. And don't we all desperately want to be found? Don't we all desperately want to be known and to be loved anyway? Psalm 139, a beautiful psalm, describes this angst as well as the, as the joy of discovery that God is the one who knows us and loves us anyway. Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways, writes the psalmist. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, so high I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed and Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. To know, to be known, and to be loved anyway takes the sting out of the betrayal that most of us have felt along the way. It takes the pain out of the abandonment that most of us have felt along the way. So if you've ever been rejected by someone that you loved, if you've known that pain, hear me say now that God always stays by you. God is always there. Hound of heaven never gives up God's pursuit for you. And at the end of that, when we are done hiding and desperately want to be found, God says, Come on in. Have a seat and welcome home. Take your shoes off. Get comfortable. You are my child and you are home. And you want to sing a lullaby with me? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind.
Child of God, stop running. Be found today and go in peace knowing that you are eternally and deeply loved. Amen. May